Hey everyone, welcome back to Lab Coats. In a previous video, I began to work on my very first dual resonant solid state Tesla coil, or DRSSTC. And for those of you who don't remember what that is, here's a little reminder. <laughs> At the time though, I wasn't able to complete the build because I was lacking a few of the key parts. Specifically, I still needed to complete a driver to control the IGBT inverter bridge, as well as an interrupter, resonant capacitor bank, and all the required ferrites to make the gate drive transformer and feedback windings. Plus, I still had to wind the secondary coil, set up the primary, and deal with the power inputs. Now, if you want to see the design process for a large DRSSTC like this, I recommend checking out the part 1 video, because I won't be going into nearly as much detail in this one. This video will be mostly focused on the overall build layout and the coil's operation and performance. So without further ado, let's get into it. For the driver, I ended up going with a tried and true UD2.7C designed by Lone Oceans, since my custom driver failed to operate. I didn't want to deal with the SMD assembly and part sourcing though, so I just paid all science to build and send me one, which I mounted in a metal box to keep out interference. The inverter bridge and bus supply haven't really changed since the last episode. But just as a reminder, this is a CM300 full bridge running off a voltage doubler made from two 3300 microfarad capacitors. Since completing the bridge, I have since added a 9 kilo ohm resistor across the IGBT outputs to help discharge the MMC, as well as a 68 nanofarad film capacitor which connects the primary coil directly to ground. Adding a capacitor like this is actually fairly common practice in larger coils, since it helps protect the IGBTs in the event of a primary strike by directing the high frequency coil output to ground. In speaking of primary, I finally got around to winding not only the primary coil, but also the secondary coil, which I coated in epoxy for protection. The primary coil has about 8 and 3 quarter turns, an outer diameter of 16 inches, and an inner diameter of 8 inches, and I built it with an adjustable tap for tuning. This pairs nicely with the 0.25 microfarad MMC capacitor bank, to give a frequency range of roughly 60 to 100 kilohertz. The coupling coefficient is right around 0.16, according to Java TC which is slightly higher than most coils I've seen, but not really high enough to seriously stress the circuit. Also, a strike rail is installed to keep most of the secondary output off the main coil. To power it, I added two 120 volt input ports, one which leads to the 24 volt power supply for the driver and fan, and the other which goes to the voltage doubler and primary inverter circuit. The toggle switch you see here is just for the cooling fan. And on the other side of the coil, you can see the connection point for the interrupter's fiber optic cable as well as an indicator LED to show if the overcurrent detector trips. Now, I could go on about how I built a custom fiber optic controller for this coil, or about how I had to hardwire the breaker on my step-up transformer to keep it from shutting off. But nobody wants to hear that, right? I didn't think so. So let's cut to the part where I fire this thing up and hope it doesn't EMP the whole neighborhood. It took a bit of tuning, but after maxing out the primary coil and raising the top load a bit to stop the coil from electrocuting itself, I finally managed to get an acceptable amount of output. It runs alright off the 120 volts from my Variac, with the output already exceeding that of my much larger SparkApp coil featured in my first video, but things get really wild when it's fed the 240 volts from my hardwired step-up transformer. That's definitely the largest electrical discharge I've ever created. I measured how far the arc could hit a metal target, and I came out with a distance of roughly 4.5 feet. That's more than 3 times the coil's length, and well within ground strike territory. Which is just insane, especially when you consider that this setup is drawing little more power than a common toaster oven. Seriously, it probably takes more energy to toast bread than it does to run this coil. I wonder... I 
Ah well, I guess Tesla coils won't be replacing toasters anytime soon. Maybe I should try using this thing as Nikola Tesla intended, to wirelessly power common objects. Here, I have a fluorescent light bulb. Let's see how well it holds up to 10,000 times its rated voltage. Alright, so it definitely lights up, but I wouldn't exactly call this an effective means of distributing power. In theory, I could build a tuned setup to extract usable power from a longer distance, but as much as the Tesla enthusiasts hate to admit it, this is a terrible way to send wireless power. Even if you had a massive coil tuned to resonate with the Earth itself, you'd still have to deal with the fact that less than 20% of the input power actually gets coupled and transmitted by the secondary. Plus, the power that does get transmitted ends up largely wasted, as it capacitively couples back to ground before reaching its destination. Hence, why Nikola Tesla's wireless power system has never been adopted, and probably never will be. Alright, the light bulb was cool and all, but I know something that'll be cooler. This is a plasma globe. I hit this particular one once before with my old spark app coil, but I didn't have a good camera back then, and the footage wasn't that great. So let's try the demo again, now with the more powerful DRSSTC. I was not expecting such vivid and distinct fractals. With my smaller solid state coils, the plasma always ended up hazy and bluish, but with the exponentially more powerful DRSSTC, red dendritic patterns seem to dominate. Pretty cool if you ask me. So if we can get colored sparks inside a glass bulb, what's stopping us from getting colored sparks into the open air? I mean, I've done it before with my smaller solid state coils by doping the electrode with chemicals, so shouldn't it work the same with the larger coil? Well, not exactly. As you can see, adding baking soda does yield some yellow sparks, but it's localized very close to the breakout point since that's where all the sodium ions are. And plus, the thin arcs caused by the fast pulse times don't exactly vaporize a lot of sodium, so the color is very mild. I do have an idea of how we can get around this though. Here I've taken off the breakout point and replaced it with this metal dish, which I've filled with a mixture of methanol and boric acid. When this mixture is ignited, it produces a nice green flame, and as we know from a previous video, fire is very conductive to high voltages. So let's see what happens when we crank up the Tesla coil. Now that is cool. You can definitely tell the arc's color has been changed. And just look at how crazy and bright the fire gets. The green color is somewhat washed out, but still, the results are downright amazing. Mixing lightning and fire is definitely my new favorite party trick. So, let's take it one step further. This balloon is filled with roughly 5 liters of propane gas, and I want to make it disappear. Well, that was intense. The whole garage door moved thanks to the sheer volume of air displaced by the fireball. Filmed again from further back, you can see just how large the flames were before dissipating. Maybe this was a bit too much gas for an indoor test. Lesson learned. So, what's something safer that I can burn with my Tesla coil? Well, here I have a wooden log that I found. Let's see if a few hundred kilovolts can set it ablaze. Huh, it seems to have a hard time with how much arc movement there is. Let's try again from point blank range. Nice. Once that carbonized channel was established, the wood lit up with no trouble at all. This does beg the obvious question though, would the arc do the same thing to human flesh? Well, let's find out. In the past, I've been zapped by various types of Tesla coils, including a staccato QCW model, a high frequency class E SSTC, and even my very first spark app coil. None of them ever hurt me, and the output from some like the QCW coil couldn't even be felt at all. Still, it's best to play it safe, so I'll be starting this test off at low power. And I'm immediately glad that I stuck to low power. Even though I've been hit by larger arcs, the low on times and comparatively high pulse rate of these sparks makes them much more noticeable to the human nervous system. All that jerking and twitching isn't me withdrawing from pain, 
it's my muscles involuntarily convulsing from the electricity. Even at the minimum operating voltage, the sparks still cause my muscles to contract like they're hooked up to an oversized TENS unit. I guess we'll never know if a Tesla coil can burn fractal patterns in my body. How unfortunate. Still, I want to know what it's like to be zapped by this terrifying machine, and I'm not stopping until I do. Fortunately, there is one way to pull off this feat without electrocuting myself, and that's with a Faraday cage. Essentially, if you surround yourself with some kind of metal barrier, the electricity will simply flow around you instead of entering your body. To demonstrate this concept, I placed my camera behind a metal cage and then fired up the coil. As you can probably tell, the camera was totally unharmed. Unfortunately though, this metal grid isn't exactly large enough for me to stand behind. So what am I going to do? I can't afford to build a larger Faraday cage since I spent all the money on the coil, and honestly, I can't think of a single thing made of metal that I'd fit inside. Actually, there is one thing. That was pretty intense. Very cool. I placed the camera inside the car for a second run, so you can all see what it was like. Now, I won't deny that this was somewhat dangerous to attempt, but overall, the risk was fairly low. I had the electrically isolated fiber optic controller with me in the car, and just for good measure, I had my brother standing by the outlet in case we needed to quickly cut the power. Still, to anyone watching with a large Tesla coil of their own, I don't recommend trying this little stunt at home. You can never be fully certain of what will happen. Well, I think that just about wraps up this episode. As always, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'd especially like to thank Creality for helping make this project possible with their Falcon 2 laser engraver. The Creality Falcon 2 is a high-quality laser cutter and engraver that boasts operating speeds as high as 25,000 millimeters per second. The unit itself comes mostly pre-assembled, and the rest can be set up in just three simple steps, attaching the risers, mounting the laser module, and connecting the air assist. Once assembled, the Falcon 2 is incredibly stable, which is part of the reason why it can print so well at such high speeds. Another reason is the groundbreaking integrated air assist, combined with Creality's patented air duct design. Believe me, having the right amount of airflow can make all the difference in a laser job, and fortunately, Creality made it really easy to adjust with just one gear. To use the Falcon 2, it's important to have the right software installed. Lightburn is an excellent choice, but if you're looking for a free option, I recommend Laser GRBL, which is what I use. With these programs, you can run the Falcon 2 completely offline, using either the included USB-C cable or the microSD card. All you have to do is create your own design in a program like Inkscape, upload it to your software interface, select the correct parameters for a given material, and laser away. With the upgraded and extremely powerful 40-watt laser head, this machine can cut up to 20 millimeters of wood in a single pass, as well as 30 millimeters of acrylic and even 0.15 millimeters of steel, which is really good for a laser cutter of this type. It's also possible to change between the normal full power mode and precision mode with a simple click of a button, allowing for much better detail capturing. And on top of all this, the beam also has no issues engraving metal surfaces, which can yield some pretty colorful results. Now, with such a powerful laser setup, one of my main concerns was obviously the safety of this device. However, I'm happy to say that after using the Falcon 2, I actually found myself quite pleased with the security of this machine. It features a so-called triple monitoring system that keeps track of nozzle airflow, flame presence, and even lens cleanliness. Normally, the system will only alert you with the lights on the laser head, but you can also enable the alarm system using a few simple software commands. For example, here's how you enable the air assist alarm in laser GRBL. Similar commands can also be used to alert you of flame presence and lens cleanliness issues. And speaking of lens cleanliness, Creality made it super easy to clean their laser lenses. All you have to do is unscrew the air nozzle, undo the support ring, and pop out the lens. The Falcon 2 kit includes a microfiber cloth and tweezers to aid in the cleaning process, as well as a new lens in case there is a more serious issue with the original. All in all, I think the Creality Falcon 2 is an amazing piece of equipment, and I'm super happy to have it in my arsenal. If you're interested in purchasing one of your own, be sure to check it out on Creality's website, using the links below. Just be aware that the honeycomb, roller unit, and product cover are not included with the standard kit, and they must be purchased separately. Alright, I think that pretty much wraps it up for this episode. Honestly, this is probably going to be my last Tesla coil project for 
a while. Uh, I've covered pretty much all of them, and honestly, my real passion lies with the chemistry. I'm sorry that I haven't been around on YouTube a whole lot recently. Um, I've been pretty busy with uh, college. I'm hoping to get back to the chemistry stuff pretty soon here. I've got a whole bunch of ideas that I really am excited to get into, but again, college comes first. So, just to put that out there, if I'm non-YouTube for a few weeks, maybe a month, or even two, don't worry, I'm not gone, just in college. Pretty much the same thing, honestly. As always, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out.